We've got a couple of cases to go over with uh, our panel of experts today. Um, we've got a 79-year-old um, female, status post left total knee arthroplasty and left hip intramedullary nail, community ambulator with assistive devices, presented after a mechanical fall. She is a little bit on the sick side. Um, not a bad BMI to deal with, that's a plus. Um, physical exam is, is uh, okay. Dr. Starr. Yes. <laughs> is there a question there? There is. Let me, uh, let me show you a little more. She has that in place. Uh -huh. Same side. And there's a CAT scan that defines the injury a little bit better. Hmm. So obviously you have a uh, fracture with a, a rod up high, a total knee in the bottom. It looks like maybe a cruciate sparing total knee. And uh, so it doesn't have a big box. And it's a rather comminuted distal fracture that's quite distal. So I'd call Matt Craig and say, Matt, this one's for you, baby. <laughs> okay, so you, you'd select to treat that with a retrograde nail or something like that? Um, well, I, I tend to lean more toward treating things with, with the locking plates, but the question is, with any of these devices, can you get any kind of fixation distally? Mm. Dr. Collins, what do you think about this injury? Can you go back to the uh, plain films again? So the, to me, the, yeah, looking at that, it looks like a far distal fracture. The fracture medially is a little bit higher than lateral. It's, Fracture disappears laterally behind the knee implant. So, of course, uh, that is concerning. Um, uh, I look at this x-ray and think, okay, that probably is platable. Uh, I think nail's probably out. Um, she's relatively healthy-ish. Well, she's relatively unhealthy, right? Yeah. She wasn't yes, bad. she's pretty unhealthy. But her body habitus is not too bad. Yeah, not a challenge, pretty, yeah. pretty good size. So if she didn't have the hip implant, there'd be some a discussion between ORIF with a plate and uh, a revision knee replacement. With the hip implant in place, um, we're probably a little less excited about using a knee implant, a revision knee implant with an intramedullary stem. Uh, so I guess there's two ways to go. I think. Uh, fixing this is going to be a little risky. If I was going to repair this with a plate, I'd slide the plate further distal than usual, and I'd try to skive some of my distal screws right off the knee implant. And the understanding there would be, and I'd augment that with cement, and the understanding there would be that it, there's some significant risk that that might fail, in which case then she'd be back for a mega prosthesis later. I think if you were going to do a, a mega prosthesis or a, a revision knee, uh, you might consider taking out the, the nail if the fracture is healed proximally, or taking out the locking screw and plating the lateral side along with the um, knee replacement at the same time. Uh, was, do we know the function of this implant prior to the surgery? Yeah, there were no issues with it. No issues with it, yeah. Yeah, she was. Uh, Ambulating with assistive devices, but no pain. It was fully functional for her. Good yeah. motion. I mean, I think, you know, obviously you can go a hundred ways with this, but the, but, you know, the thing that is the most appealing to me in this case, given that she's not the healthiest person, would be, even though a, a mega prosthesis is the easiest operation that I do, the rod's in the way, uh, so that creates a problem. But it just seems to me like you can do, you know, if you can do one thing, you can put a plate on this and overlap proximally, take out one locking screw. I take out the locking screw. It seems like that's probably your simplest bet, but you know you can you can find ways to do everything in every different way. You could you could get away with a tumor with a uh, revision style prosthesis with this with a stem or with a sleeve or something, and uh, and you know if you're crazy enough, you just put a plate on the outside while you're there. You know, or you, or you as you mentioned, you can take the rod out. 
Well, um, so the reality is that um, intraoperatively the decision was made that the bone stock was really poor and no way to change things. So it was a well-planned operation. The uh, hip implant was removed and uh, she went on to have um, a distal femoral replacement and, and did very well with it. Um, the, technically, it looked like too much of a challenge to try to uh, fix this internally. Um, I'm not going to answer my phone anymore. Yeah, really. <laughs> what was the distance? How, how close did you get to the rod? Um, it, it, was, it was pretty it, close, so they, they just decided to take the rod out, yeah. It was very close, and that would have been a, a huge uh, stress riser. So, so the benefit to this, I think, the big benefit is she gets to bear weight. Right away. and which, uh, With that medical issue. history is probably yeah. important. Yeah. Now, yeah. If, it, if it breaks above that implant or uh, gets infected, you know, there's well, some downside to that. But yeah. yeah. The sense. consideration here is this is a patient with cirrhosis. Her ability to heal things up is limited. And um, with poor quality bone, um, that uh, that all adds up to uh, a thought process that uh, found its way to this. Um, okay, uh, anybody uh, have any questions in the audience about this? Dr. Lands, you have any questions? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, it really uh, doesn't fully incorporate ever. Um, I spend a fair amount of my time excising um, grafts that were put in um, for people earlier in their lives and uh, trying to do things like bone transport to reconstitute it. So, yeah, I, I think they have a tendency to, to fracture and refracture and become a real nuisance. Um, Corey, do you, do you have any... Uh, any experience with that? So uh, I, I missed a little bit of the question. So, the, the, so intercalary grafts, you know, where yeah. you, you put an allograft uh, to replace the, the mid part of the femur. I've seen that uh, a fair amount. That was popular by tumor surgeons in the yeah. past. And uh, there were actually some traumatologists that use them. I think the traumatologist group have had really good luck without using allograft and use, use the metal implants uh, for all the stability. I think the only time I've, I'm interested in using an allograft is if there's bone loss. So if there's the a plate's been wallowing around on the outside of the bone or a nail's been wallowing around on the inside of the bone, if the bone quality is so bad that you're concerned about segments, um, then, then I would think about a, an allograft. But I think there's biologic cost to putting allografts on and they don't seem to add a whole lot more stability than you can get with the modern lock plates yeah. or modern nails. Yeah. And the reason I ask that is because in the community we're seeing more, you know, more of these are being done and the big boys are doing like with total femurs with that stuff. And so you occasionally have someone show up in the ER with pain or possibly an infection. So if you have like an infected one of these that's had a big intercalary allograft, uh, first of all, I don't know if that's easily handled in the community, but if they have a big piece of dead bone in there that's infected, it's probably a chronic thing that's blossomed. And uh, you know, how do you suggest those are handled? I mean, it sounds like it's a major stabilization. Yeah. Well, so, uh, I look at this lady's bone, and I think you know her corte her cor cortical bone is really not bad. She doesn't have big defects or anything. Um, so in this case, I would not even consider putting in an allograft, but I think if, if she had had a, an intramedullary nail that had been wallowing around, it had a nonunion, or there's bone loss, a significant amount of bone loss, then I think that's the case that I would think about it, an allograft strut. Okay. Yes, sir. Question on this case here. Uh, in regards to your, your planning, uh, what was your initial approach 
to the knee to determine if the bone was poor? Did you do a lateral approach? Did you do a parapatellar approach, thinking that you might have to take out the bone uh, or take out the prosthesis? And the distal locking screw for the short nail, did the cement cross over where, where the distal locking was? And did you weight bear her post-op? Because taking out a, a short, you know, a trochanteric femoral nail on someone with this age, to weight bear them immediately, they could have a, a fracture through the, the, the defect proximally in her hip. So my question is, is how did you approach it with an incision, uh, and did you weight bear her post-op? Yeah, the, um, I actually didn't do the surgery, one of my partners did, but the thought process uh, was to evaluate it under uh, fluoro. They were prepared to do everything, and they felt that there wasn't enough bone stock distally to have a fair chance. The, the, the thing that weighed very heavily here was the cirrhosis. And this is, this is a relatively sick lady who didn't have a lot of um, potential for healing. Um, the um, the, the uh, locking screw hole was blocked with a locking screw, so cement didn't pour through it during the implantation. And um, th there was no uh, protection post-op. I've, I've stopped uh, thinking about holes from screws a long time ago. I used to protect them for three or four weeks. Um, but I, I, Corey, how do, how do you feel about protecting holes after you remove screws? Yeah, I'm not too, not too worried about it. Usually there'd be some cortical um, you know, stress reaction around it anyway, where I think you take it out, there's, there's a hard core of cortical bone around it anyway. Yeah. I, 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 decade ago in the Orthopedic Trauma Association, we sort of stopped protecting holes from removed screws. It just sort of grew among the crowd that you, you really don't have to limit patients for that extended period of time. Andy, would you uh, do that? You know, I, I think this is kind of an interesting case because you, you know, and the audience highlights one of the issues, which is that obviously whoever was doing this kind of went in there with the notion that I think I'm probably going to do distal femoral replacement. You know, because it because really there are very two quite different techniques with different approaches, and you know, having the equipment in the room. You know, as, although I talked about being prepared, you know, having the equipment in the room to do a distal femoral replacement as well as a locking distal plate and then the approach is being quite different. But then the other thing that kind of comes to mind here is I'm less worried about the screw hole, I'm just worried about this woman having another fracture. And I think you mentioned that. Yep. You know, I kind of like the idea of giving this lady a metal femur. You know, she's, she's not in the greatest of shape, you know, and if there's a way to just kind of bridge everything, that's what I like about the plate because it, it's gonna overlap the prior fracture. She's already broken her femur twice. And now you're putting a, now she has a stiff distal segment with a previously operated on proximal femur. And you know, how long is it going to be before she's back in the emergency room with a, uh, with another fracture? So, you know, I think in these elderly patients, and it's kind of like when you get a fracture in between two prostheses, in these elderly patients, if you can make them to have what basically is a metal femur, I think that they're probably better off. Although the downside of that is you can't wait for them right away. Right. I'm a little surprised, I'm not an arthroplasty guy, but I'm a little surprised that the um, proximal end of that um, distal femur replacement doesn't have more of an anatomic bend. Is that a pretty straight? Yeah, they're straight. Stamp? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they put a bow to that? Um, <clears throat> you know, the <laughs> it's generally what's available. I mean, there are, cur there are curved stems that you can get, but they're technic it's technically more difficult to use. You have to put them in right the right way and you know we have that the most common uh, long stem proximal femurs now are just being done with straight stems and you know there are problems with the stem tip but that's a it's a good question because mm -hmm. they don't have to that's the answer yeah <laughs> well the other thing is you know a lot of these people they sort of have stove by the time you're doing revisions on them which is where we most commonly see this they kind of have stovepipe femurs with not a lot of you know big open femurs that are pretty straight and oversized and distorted so you're really not dealing with an anatomic thing. Yeah. But it is interesting how many straight stems. We you know, see it in the femoral side all the time. We use these long straight stems. I mean, we have curved stems, but most people use long straight stems. OK. Um, do I just go forward? The next case will show up. OK. Here we go. Um, this is a 72-year-old female, avid Penn State football fan. Uh, was at Happy Valley. Um, she uh, was a little disappointed in the outcome of the game 
And on her way to the car uh, in a snowy parking lot, she slipped and fell. Um, she was status post bilateral hip replacements um, and she had some discomfort in her right hip. She showed up at another ER, um, small community hospital near Happy Valley. Um, they didn't particularly find anything, but she uh, still felt uncomfortable and she wound up uh, in our ER. How far out is she here? Pardon me? How far out is she here from her injury? Uh, this is uh, the next day. So she spent an evening in, in the ER in another place and then next morning came to our ER because it, it still hurt. Okay, so the question is what's going on here? She obviously has some reaction. She's got a fracture of her distal femur. She's got some reaction around the stem. You know, is this a loose stem that, you know, fractured through this? You know, is this an acute fracture? Is this a stress fracture that's been coming on? Mm. You know, so the issue is, as with all of these, is the stem really loose or is the stem tight? She uh, was ambulating, ad lib, no assistive devices, uh, without pain. Without pain. Prior to the fall. The fall probably came because she was so disappointed in the outcome. Michigan. Uh, and I can see that, but there is one problem with the story. She's 72 years old, she's at a Penn State game, and she has no alcohol history. No. I'm confused about that. I'm, I'm thinking this is a contrived case or something. I think we have, we have several uh, Penn State fans in the audience here, and I know they all have alcohol problems. Albie, he's got one. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, Right, so the, the issue is, is, I mean, I think the issue here is, is the stem loose. It's an easy fracture to fix if you're going to fix it, um, you know, with a, with a plate with, with multiple screws and maybe some wires. Yeah. But the question is, when you go in there, you have to really be prepared. And the question is, in this case, unfortunately, since the fracture is not displaced, how are you going to evaluate whether the stem's loose? How old is this hip? Uh, this hip was uh, about eight or nine years old at that time. Yeah. So I look at this and... The, the fracture doesn't, I mean, there's obviously this bony reaction, and, but even the fracture doesn't look fresh. So I, I guess I want more imaging. I want some obliques, a lateral CT with metal subtraction or even tomograms. So I'm just still confusing to me, yeah. So get a little bit clearer look there. And then we had a little Mars. So you can see that there's cortical injury there that sort of comes up the stem. She can't weight bear on this. So the, I look at that and I think I'm a little bit reassured that the stem's probably not loose, but again, I'm not the slick arthroplasty guy, but I, from the trauma guy perspective, it looks like it's probably stable. If you go back to the, the initial plane film, um, she's 72, she's a uh, vigorous 72. I think uh, doing something operatively makes sense here because if it, she stumbles or try to protect the weight bearing and it fractures and displaces, that is a huge problem. This is a manageable problem, I think. Uh, unless I'm missing something, um, which would be amenable to a plating, maybe even a minim minimally invasive plating, and I'd probably let her bear weight on it very quickly. And I mean, the one other thing you have to tell her, you know, ironically, the, the more displaced fractures are kind of easier to manage because you can go in and have a revision stem and you can open the thing up and then play with the stem and decide whether it's, for, it's unstable proximally. The bad news in this case for this woman is sort of the good news, which is that it isn't really displaced. So I would tell her that I'm going to plate this thing, and if the stem turns out to be loose later, I'm going to have to revise it. But I don't think that's disastrous, because you don't really have it. I mean, you've got some funny things going on here. You don't like to see that reaction at the tip of a stem, although sometimes you do, although not generally with this stem. Um, 
I think you just plate it and tell her if the stem is loose, you may have to deal with it later. But we do know if the stems are loose, and I don't think that's a controversial area. If it's a B2 and you fix the fracture, <clears throat> unless the patient's very inactive in a nursing home, you're going to be back revising that stem. So I think my, for the repair, um, I would go, I'd run a plate from the lateral flare, the proximal femur, and I'd run the plate long. And I might even use a plate that came down all the way to the distal flare and protect the whole femur so that she, when she falls, uh, when they're winning the national championship in five years, uh, she won't break then. <laughs> and then I'd definitely put some cables around the proximal segment and try to shore up the hoop stresses that may be going on there and then maybe put a couple of unicortical screws as well proximally and some I think bicortical screws like Andrew was showing in, in his um, talk. He'd basically do what Andrew said. I think more is you know, better and one thing you know, which I think people may don't want to do, misinterpret which I learned from my uh, partner Dr. Craig but it's that use long plates and don't use a whole lot of screws. You use enough screws but you don't want to put a screw in every hole. That kind of was the way we did it years ago. But basically, I would use everything here. I'd use unicortical screws, some wires proximally, bicortical screws distally, and a little bit longer plate, a la Dr. Craig, or he would yell at me afterwards. Uh, any uh, other thoughts from the audience? Any questions? There's one other thing, if we, can, if we have one second. Can you put up his slides? The second speaker. Dr. Dr. Collins. And run through them. I want to get the picture he showed of the end of the prosthesis. Oh, that's mine. Did you close it? Yeah, that's it. Now run through. The, go, go down through or put up the slide sort of. Because you had a great picture of the end of the femur. The point that I was trying to raise is everybody looks at, you know, they think, oh, it's a cruciate sparing knee which has an open box, and it's easy to put a rod in. You know, go up to the slide sorter again. Yes, it's, uh, They're not working. Okay. Well, I'll make my point without the picture. He just happened to have a very good picture that illustrated it. You know, everybody assumes that since it's a cruciate sparing knee, that the box is going to be easy to work with. And in a cruciate sparing knee, a lot of times the metal on the prosthesis goes back more posteriorly than you realize. So you have a big opening, but when you go to put a rod in from below, you always are angling the rod up. I think you showed that on your pictures. But I just want to illustrate that, because I think what happens sometimes is people say, oh, it's an open box. I'll just put a rod in from below. But a lot of times it's hard to get the rod anterior enough to get it a straight shot up the femur. It just happened, I saw it on that picture. I thought if we had a second, we'd show it. So, and, uh, I've got some friends in the manufacturing business. I know that there's some newer generation nails that are going to increase their insertion angle, their Herzog bend, if you will, um, to address that and actually move the starting point more posteriorly just to sneak around more um, knee, knee implants. So, um well, while we're waiting for the slides to come back, um, I had a long talk with this young lady and um, her and her husband, and they really wanted to um, do whatever had to be done then. She didn't want to come back to the operating room. She wanted to make sure that she didn't miss next season, uh, and Albie can understand that. Um, so um, we went into the operating room um, with the notion to test the implant, and uh, make sure it wasn't loose. And if it wasn't loose, um, um, if it wasn't loose, just go ahead with fixation. I was a little worried. I was leaning on the loose side because of the way the, the tip of that implant looked. Um, that was pretty profound, and that's where the, the failure occurred. It looked like it failed there and then spiraled up. But I, yeah, oddly enough, this was well fixed. Uh, there was no question about it. So we just went ahead and used a long plate and uh, did exactly uh, what, what most of you thought would, should be done. She was up on her feet and out of the hospital uh, like post-op day three. And um, I actually just saw her, it was about uh, three years uh, from this injury. She's doing very well. I saw her for a shoulder problem. 
and she's still going to all the games. A little disappointed in the last season, Albie, but uh, she's looking forward to this. So, um, now, whoever did her hip, they put four screws in the acetabulum. Was that because she was a Penn State fan, or? Uh, it may well be. He obviously was nervous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little, whoever did it uh, must be on a regular dose of diazepam, is my guess. But exactly. yeah. Um, all right. I guess uh, even though we're, we're minus one speaker, we've wound up using all the time. Uh, please uh, 